Columbia presents another of its programs in which prominent speakers talk about current topics of vital national interest. Tonight you will hear Henry A. Wallace, Vice President of the United States. Vice President Wallace speaks from the Grand Ballroom of the Commodore Hotel in New York at the dinner of the Free World Association as a part of the United Nations program. He will be introduced by Mrs. J. Borden Harriman, former United States Minister to Norway. At the present moment, the Vice President is speaking in Spanish to people of Spanish nationality of South America here at the Commodore Hotel. We return you to the speaker's platform for the end of Mr. Wallace's speech in Spanish, after which he will be introduced by Mrs. J. Borden Harriman. Presenciando los últimos espasmos del monstruo teotónico. En todos, en todos los ámbitos del mundo, la gente del pueblo lleva la luminosa inspiración de su propia dignidad. El triunfo de la libertad está asegurado. I might have understood it all, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> Is this on now? Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, tonight the representatives of this democratic movement all over the world are gathered in the grand ballroom of the Commodore Hotel on the occasion of the second free world dinner dedicated to the United Nations in war and in peace. Millions are of people are listening in, in this country, in Latin America, in the Far East, and in the subjugated countries, to the proceedings of this dinner. Many of you have probably read Vice President Wallace's article in the Free World magazine about inter-American cooperation. I quote from his article in the March issue of Free World, quote, The new world unity and cooperation undertaken freely by independent nations offers a sharp contrast to the discord, oppression, and coercion with which the nations of Europe and Asia are now cursed. The combination of idealism and common sense which now unites the Americas augurs well for the future, even though dark, though dark days lie directly ahead. Americans everywhere, determined to preserve liberty and democracy, turn to the task of defeating Hitler and his cohorts, and we will not fail. I tried to write down a few of the things I thought about the Vice President, but I found it was going to take too long, and I just want to say that it is my great privilege to introduce to you on behalf of the Free World Association, the Honorable Henry A. Wallace, Vice President of the United States. Madam Chairman, and you who have spoken so eloquently tonight, and you who represent 33 different na nations on this particular occasion, and I wish especially to recognize those who are representing the 14 nations from Latin America, I want to say to all, all who in a formal or an informal way represent most, if not all, of the free, people, free peoples of the world who are met here tonight, that we are meeting in the interests of the millions of all the nations who have freedom in their souls. To my mind, this meeting has just one purpose, to let those millions in the other countries know that here in the United States, are 130 million men, women, and children who are in this war to the finish. Applause 
Our American people are utterly resolved to go on until they can strike the relentless blows that will assure a complete victory and with it a new day for the lovers of freedom everywhere on this earth. This is a fight between a slave world and a free world. Just as in the United States in 1862, we could not remain half slave and half free, so in 1942, the world must make its decision for a complete victory one way or the other. As we begin the final stages of this fight to the death between the free world and the slave world, it is worthwhile to refresh our minds about the march of freedom for the common man. The idea of freedom, the freedom that we in the United States know and love so well, is derived from the Bible with its extraordinary emphasis on the dignity of the individual. Democracy is the only true political expression of Christianity. The prophets of the Old Testament were the first to preach social justice. But that which was sensed by the prophets many centuries before Christ was not given complete and powerful political expression until our nation here in the United States was formed as a federal union a century and a half ago. Even then, the march of the common people had just begun. Most of them did not yet know how to read and write. There were no public schools. Men and women cannot be really free until they have plenty to eat and time and ability to read and think and talk things over. Down the years, the people of the United States have moved steadily forward in the practice of democracy. Through universal education, they can now read and write and form opinions of their own. They have learned and are still learning the art of production, how to make a living. They have learned and are still learning the art of self-government. If we were to measure freedom by standards of nutrition, education, and self-government, we might rank the United States and certain nations of Western Europe very high, but this would not be fair to other nations where education has become widespread only in the last 20 years. In many nations a generation ago, nine out of 10 of the people could not read or write. Russia, for example, was changed from an illiterate to a literate nation within one generation. And in the process, Russia's appreciation of freedom was tremendously increased. In China, the growth in education and reading and, and the ability of the people to read and write during the past 30 years has been matched by an increased interest in real liberty. Everywhere, reading and writing are accompanied by industrial progress. And industrial progress, sooner or later, inevitably brings a strong labor, mo labor movement. From a long time and fundamental point of view, there are no backward peoples which are lacking in mechanical sense. Russians, Chinese, and the Indians, both of India and the Americas, all learn to read and write and operate machines just as well as your children or my children. Everywhere the common people are on the march. By the millions they are learning to read and write, learning to think together, learning to use tools. They are learning to think and work together in labor movements, some of which may be extreme or a little impractical at first, but which eventually will settle down to serve effectively the interests of the common man. When the freedom-loving people march, 
When the farmers have an opportunity to buy land at reasonable prices and sell the produce of their land through their own organizations, when workers have the opportunity to form unions and bargain through them collectively, and when the children of all the people have an opportunity to attend schools which teach them the truth of the real world, when these opportunities are open to everyone, then the world moves straight ahead. But in countries where the ability to read and write has been recently acquired, and mind you, 62% of the people of the world today do not yet know how to read and write, but in those countries where the ability has been recently acquired or where the people have had no long experience in governing themselves on the basis of their own thinking, it is easy for demagogues to arise and prostitute the mind of the common man to their own base end. Such a demagogue may get financial help from some person of wealth who is unaware of what the end result will be. With this backing, the demagogue may dominate the minds of the people and from whatever degree of freedom they have, lead them back into a most degraded slavery. Herr Thiessen, the wealthy German steel man, little realized what he was doing when he gave Hitler enough money to enable him to play on the minds of the German people. The demagogue is the curse of the modern world. And of all the demagogues, the worst are those financed by well-meaning, wealthy men who sincerely believe that their wealth is likely to be safer if they can hire men with political it to change the, the signposts and lure the people back into slavery. <laughs> Unfortunately for the wealthy men who finance movements of this sort, as well as for the people themselves. The successful demagogue is a powerful genie who, when once let out of his bottle, refuses to obey anyone's command. As long as his spell holds, he defies God himself, and Satan is turned loose on the world. Through the, leader, through the leaders of the Nazi revolution, Satan is now trying to lead the common man of the whole world back into slavery and darkness. For the stark truth is that the violence preached by the Nazis is the devil's own religion of darkness. So also is the doctrine that one race or one class is by heredity superior, and that all other races or classes are supposed to be slaves. The belief in one Satan-inspired Führer, with his Quislings, his Lavals, his Mussolinis, his Gauleiters in every nation in the world, is the last and ultimate darkness. Is there any hell hotter than that of being a Quisling? unless it is that of being a Laval or a Mussolini? <laughs> in a twisted sense, there is something almost great in the figure of the supreme devil operating through a human form, in a Hitler who has the daring to spit straight into the eye of God and man. But the Nazi system has a heroic position for only one leader. By definition, only one person is allowed to retain full sovereignty over his own soul. All the rest are stooges. They are stooges who have been mentally and politically degraded and who feel that they can get square with the world only by mentally and politically degrading other people. These stooges are really psychopathic cases. Satan has turned loose upon us the insane. The search of the freedom, the march of freedom 
of the past 150 years has been a long, drawn-out people's revolution. In this great revolution of the people, there were the American Revolution of 1775, the French Revolution of 1792, the Latin American revolutions of the Bolivarian era, the German Revolution of 1848 and the Russian Revolution of 1918. Each spoke for the common man in terms of blood on the battlefield. Some went to excess. But the significant thing is that the people groped their way to the light. More of them learned to think and work together. The people's revolution aims at peace and not at violence. But if the rights of the common man are attacked, it unleashes the ferocity of the she-bear who has lost a cub. When the Nazi psychologists tell their master Hitler that we in the United States may be able to produce hundreds of thousands of planes, but that we have no will to fight, they are only fooling themselves and him. The truth is that when the rights of the American people are transgressed, as these rights have been transgressed, the American people will fight with a relentless fury which will drive the ancient Teutonic gods back cowering into their caves. <laughs> the Getter Demerung has come for Odin and his crew. The people are on the march toward an even fuller freedom than the most fortunate peoples of the world have hitherto enjoyed. No Nazi counter-revolution will stop it. The common man will smoke the Hitler stooges out into the open in the United States, in Latin America, in India. He will... <coughs> He will destroy their influence. No Lavelles, no Mussolinis will be tolerated in a free world. The people in their millennial and revolutionary march toward manifesting here on earth the dignity that is in every human soul hold as their credo the four freedoms enunciated by President Roosevelt in his message to Congress on January 6, 1941. These four freedoms are the very core of the revolution for which the United Nations have taken their stand. We who live in the United States may think there is nothing very revolutionary about freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and freedom from fear, freedom from the secret police. But when we begin to think about the significance of freedom from want for the average man, then we know that the revolution of the past 150 years has not been completed either here in the United States or any place else in the world. We know that this revolution cannot stop until freedom from want has actually been attained. And now as we move forward toward realizing the four freedoms of this people's revolution, I would like to speak about four duties. It is my belief that every freedom, every right, every privilege has its price, its corresponding duty, without which it cannot be enjoyed. The four duties of the people's revolution, as I see them, as of this day, are these. One, the duty to produce to the limit. Two, the duty to transport as rapidly as possible to the line of battle. Three, the duty to fight with all that is in us. And four, the duty to build a peace, just, 
charitable, and enduring. The fourth duty is that which inspires the other three. We failed in our job after World War I. We did not know how to, go, how to go about it to build an enduring worldwide peace. We did not have the nerve to follow through and prevent Germany from rearming. We did not, <coughs> we did not insist that she learn war no more. We did not build a peace treaty on the fundamental doctrine of the people's revolution. We did not strive wholeheartedly to create a world where there could be freedom from want for all the peoples. But by our very errors, we learn much. And after this war, we shall be in position to utilize our knowledge in building a world which is economically, politically, and I hope spiritually sound. Modern science, which is a byproduct and essential part of the people's revolution, has made it technologically possible to see that all the people of the world get enough to eat. Half in fun, half seriously, I said the other day to Madame Litvino, the object of this war is to make it sure that everyone can have a quart of milk to drink every day. And she said, Yes, even half a pint. The peace must mean a better standard of living for the common man, not merely in the United States and England, but also in India, Russia, China, and Latin America, not merely in the United Nations, but also in Germany, Italy, and Japan. Some have spoken of the American century, I say that the century on which we are entering, the century which will come into being after this war, can be and must be the century of the common man. <laughs> Perhaps it will be America's opportunity to support the freedom and duties by which the common man must live. Everywhere the common man must learn to build his own industry with his own hands in practical fashion. Everywhere the common man must learn to increase his productivity so that he and his children can eventually pay to the world community all that they have received. No nation will have the God-given right to exploit other nations. Older nations will have the privilege to help younger nations get started on the path to industrialization. But there must be neither military nor economic imperialism. The, <clears throat> the methods of the 19th century will not work in the people's century, which is now about to begin. India, China, and Latin America have a tremendous stake in the people's century. As their masses learn to read and write, and as they become productive mechanics, their standard of living will double and treble. Modern science, when devoted wholeheartedly to the general welfare, has in it potentialities of which we do not yet dream. And modern science must be released from German slavery. International cartels that serve American greed and German will to power must go. Cartels in the peace to come must be subjected to international control for the common man, as well as being under adequate control by the respective home governments. In this way, we can prevent the Germans from again building a war machine while we sleep. With international monopoly pools under control, it will be possible for inventions to serve all the people instead of only the few. Yes, and when the time of peace comes, the citizen will again have a duty. The consumer will have a duty. 
the supreme duty of sacrificing the lesser interest for the greater interest of the general welfare. Those who write the peace must think of the whole world. There can be no privileged people. We ourselves in the United States are no more a master race than the Nazis. And we cannot perpetuate economic warfare without planting the seeds of military warfare. We must use our power at the peace table to build an economic peace that is charitable and enduring. If we really believe that we are fighting for a people's peace, all the rest becomes easy. Production, yes. It'll be easy to get production without either strikes or sabotage. Production with a wholehearted cooperation between willing arms and keen brains. Enthusiasm, zip, energy, geared to the tempo of keeping everlastingly at it day after day. Hitler knows as well as those of us who sit in on the war production board meetings that we here in the United States are winning the battle of production. He knows that both labor and business in the United States are doing a most remarkable job and that his only hope is to crash through to a complete victory sometime during the next six months then there's a tra task of transportation to the line of battle by truck, and railroad car, and ship. We shall joyously deny ourselves so that our transportation system is improved by at least 30%. and there will have to be some denying and you're going to hear plenty about it. <laughs> I need say little about the duty to fight. Some people declare and Hitler believes that the American people have grown soft in the last generation. Hitler agents continually preach in South America that we are cowards, unable to use like the brave German soldiers the weapons of modern war. It is true that American youth hates war with a holy hatred. But because of that fact, and because Hitler and the German people stand as the very symbol of war, we shall fight with a tireless enthusiasm until war and the possibility of war have been removed from this planet. We shall cleanse the plague spot of Europe, which is Hitler's Germany, not the real Germany, and with it the hellhole of Asia, which is Japan. The American people have always had guts and always will have. You know the story of bomber pilot Dixon and radio man Gene Aldrich and ordnance man Tony Pastula. The story which Americans will be telling their children for generations to come as an illustration of man's ability to master any fate. These men lived for 34 days. The open sea in a rubber life raft, eight feet by four feet. No food but that which they took from the sea and air with one pocket knife and a pistol. And yet they lived it through and came at last to the beach of an island they did not know. In spite of their suffering, they stood like men with no weapon left to protect themselves, no shoes on their feet or clothes on their back, and walked in military file because they said, if there were Japs, we didn't want to be crawling.
the American fighting man, and all the fighting men of the United Nations will need to summon all their courage during the next few months. I am convinced that the summer and fall of 1942 will be a time of supreme crisis for all of us. Hitler, like the prize fighter, who realizes that he is on the verge of being knocked out, is gathering all his remaining forces for one last desperate blow. There is abject fear in the heart of the madman and a growing discontent among his people as he prepares for his last all-out offensive. We may be sure that Hitler and Japan will cooperate to do the unexpected. Perhaps an attack by Japan against Alaska and our northwest coast at the time when German transport planes will be shuttled across from Dakar to furnish leadership and stiffening to a German uprising in Latin America. In any event, the psychological and sabotage offensive in the United States and Latin America will be timed to coincide with or anticipate by a few weeks the height of the military offensive. We must be especially prepared to stifle the fifth columnists in the United States. <laughs> who will try to sabotage not merely our war material plants, but even more important, infinitely more important, our minds. We must be prepared for the worst kind of fifth column work in Latin America, much of it operating through the agency of governments with which the United States at present is at peace. When I say this, I recognize that the peoples, the peoples both of Latin America and of the nations supporting the agencies through which the fifth columnists work are overwhelmingly on the side of the democracies. We must expect the offensive against us on the military, propaganda, and sabotage fronts, both in the United States and Latin America, to reach its apex sometime during the next few months. The convulsive efforts of the dying madman will be so great that some of us may be deceived into thinking that the situation is bad at the very time when it is really getting better. But in the case of most of us, the events of the next few months, disturbing though they may be, will only increase our will to bring about complete victory in this war of liberation. Prepared in spirit, we cannot be surprised. Psychological terrorism will fall flat. As we nerve ourselves for the supreme effort in this hemisphere, we must not forget the sublime heroism of the oppressed in Europe and Asia, whether it be in the mountains of Yugoslavia the factories of Czechoslovakia and France, the farms of Poland, Denmark, Holland and Belgium, among the seamen of Norway, or in the occupied areas of China and the Dutch East Indies. Everywhere the soul of man is letting the tyrant know that slavery of the body does not end resistance. There can be no half measures, north, south, east, west, and middle west. The will of the American people is for complete victory. No compromise with Satan is possible. We shall not rest until the victims under the Nazi and Japanese yoke are freed. 
we shall fight for a complete peace as well as a complete victory. The people's revolution is on the march, and the devil and all his angels cannot prevail against it. They cannot prevail, for on the side of the people is the Lord. He giveth power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increaseth strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Strong in the strength of the Lord, we who fight in the people's cause, will never stop until that cause is won. You have just heard an address by Henry A. Wallace, Vice President of the United States. Vice President Wallace spoke from the Grand Ballroom of Commodore Hotel in New York City at the dinner of the Free World Association as a part of the United Nations program. He was introduced by Mrs. J. Borden Harriman, former United States Minister to Norway. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.